By way of introduction to our lesson this morning, and you've already heard the title of our lesson, the title of our lesson is What Can Kill a Church? And I'll tell you what kind of sparked my thoughts um, on this topic. I was uh, watching a YouTube video. I, I like to watch YouTube videos. I watched a lot of YouTube videos this past week trying to figure out how to do a wedding. <laughs> I hope it went okay. But I was watching this YouTube video about the life cycle of churches. And the name of this video that I was actually watching that sparked my thoughts this morning was Your Church Will Close. That was the headline. So obviously when you see a headline like that, that's very attention grabbing. One observation was made that it's very rare to see a church that lasts more than 100 years. Particularly with churches of Christ, it's rather rare to see a congregation that lasts that period of time. I was doing just a little bit of research trying to figure out how accurate that is. Uh, Market Street, actually in Athens on their website, uh, says that their beginning started in 1884. So that would obviously be an exception to that rule. And admittedly, I'm not from North Alabama. Y'all know I'm from from, uh, Middle Tennessee. And I don't know all the history of this area. Some of y'all might could tell me a little bit better. I've also not been around for 100 years, so that's another reason why I may not know uh, everything. But I do think that the observation is a fair one. In some circumstances, a local congregation may have to close to different reasons. And sometimes those reasons may be reasons that that congregation cannot control. You know, sometimes there are economic factors that impact a particular area. Sometimes if jobs move, you know, to another location, people move with those jobs. With that, you know, the local congregation, the, the membership may decline along with the population of that area. I can actually think of one congregation in particular. 20 years ago, this congregation was booming. But now, it is dying a very slow death. Nothing that they can really control. The area around them, the neighborhood around them, is just not the same as it was 20 years ago. Again, there are many reasons why this could happen. Again, sometimes outside of our control. So if a church closes, that's nothing that we really need to be ashamed of, depending on the reason. Another thing that I was thinking about with that, as far as I'm aware, and y'all may know differently, you think of all the different churches that were mentioned during the New Testament times. As far as I'm aware, none of those have survived to modern day today. What we want to talk about this morning, though, is not only can a church die in the sense that it ceases to exist, but a church can also die in more ways than one. I think of the church at Sardis. Uh, We were talking about them when we were looking at the seven churches of Asia. They were mentioned to have all the appearances of being alive, but they were dead, or they were near death, as that passage alludes to. So churches may die in the sense that they cease to exist. They can also die inwardly while still existing physically. So in this lesson, I want us to talk about this question, what can kill a church? Again, as Brother Douthat said, it's a very important question. It's a very serious subject. It's not something that any of us, I hope, wants. Again, sometimes there are factors outside of our control, but this morning I'm not talking about that. This morning we're going to talk about some potential answers to this question. Things that we need to be aware of. Things that perhaps we can control. Things that we need to be guarding against, if at all possible. One of the greatest dangers to the church, and this is both short-term and long-term, is false teaching. I know that I've talked about false teaching a lot in the past. I'm going to mention it briefly here because I think it is an answer to this question and we'll move on to some other things that may be more new. False teaching uh, is nothing new. It's not a new issue. It's a tactic that Satan has been using to kill churches going all the way back to the first century. For example, thinking about those seven churches of Asia, you think about the the first uh, group of that or the first church that was mentioned in that text, the Ephesian church. It talks about how they had been threatened by false apostles, but they had tested them. And you think about had they not done that, well, it could have killed that church. In that very same passage, it goes on talking about the church at Pergamos. They were ones that stood strong against persecution, but they were being plagued by false teaching. Some held to the teaching of Balaam, some to the Nicolaitans, and they were told they needed to repent. If they didn't, it would be a detriment to that church. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to take a passage from this 
chapter. Paul, or I mean, I'm sorry, not Paul. Peter in this passage is speaking regarding the dangers and the reality of false teachers. He says there at the beginning of that chapter, he says, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle. And their destruction is not asleep. Was the threat of false teaching in Peter's time? Was it a danger for the church? Absolutely. Is it a problem for us even today? Absolutely. If we're not guarding against it. Peter indicates in this passage that false teachers are destructive. Acts chapter 20, when Paul was warning the Ephesian elders, he described false teachers as fierce wolves that would wreak havoc on the flock. So understanding the dangers that, that false teaching poses to the church, what can we do to keep that from killing the church? Well, one, we need to preach the word. Paul, in the context of talking about the possibility uh, to Timothy about people wandering away from the truth, he told Timothy, preach the word. That's a responsibility that I have. It's a responsibility that Brother Eubanks has. It's a responsibility that the teachers here have to preach the word. The elders, they have a responsibility to make sure that we are teaching the word, teaching the truth. But the thing is, is that you can preach the truth. You can teach the word. But it's not going to amount to much if you're not enduring sound teaching. Because verse 3 of that same passage I just mentioned talks about how trouble comes when people do not endure that sound teaching. You know, so often it's human nature. Either we want something new, we want something that's exciting, something that appeals to us personally. And often we have this mindset that we have heard the same teachings our entire lives. Those of y'all that have grown up going to church all of your lives. You may have heard some of the same lessons. Maybe you've even heard me say some of the same things multiple times. Sometimes we just want something different. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that we ought to study the exact same thing every single week, week in and week out. I, hopefully you don't get too bored. Hopefully I do try and mix it up a good bit. And, you know, mixing up challenging messages along with teaching those basics. But I want you to understand, sometimes when we think something is repetitive or something has been emphasized enough, what may be basic and what may be known to you may not be known by the person that's sitting next to you. You know, we often emphasize the basic truths because we're wanting to make sure that we're not led away by that, you know, those that might be teaching false. We must endure that sound teaching and we must support those that teach the truth. Because it's very important. In another passage, Second John. Second John, that's not chapter nine. There's only one chapter. Second John, verses nine through eleven. I'm going to read this passage. It teaches us that we ought not tolerate a false teacher. He says, starting in verse nine, he says, "Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son." If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. If someone comes in here and is trying to lead people away from the truth, we are not to tolerate that. But I want you to understand, sometimes there is a confusion about what a false teacher is. I think 2 Peter, Jude, both of them talk about the description of false teachers. That's a discussion for another time. But I want you to understand there can, be, there can be confusion about what actually constitutes a false teacher. What I mean by that is that even in this room, looking at every single one of us, I don't believe that there is a pair of us that agrees on every single detail of the Bible. That would be nice, but it's very unlikely. Sometimes also I think of situations where someone may misspeak. Someone that speaks every single week I misspeak a lot, probably more uh, than I should. Sometimes people just make mistakes. They don't have any bad intentions. They're not trying to lead people astray. They just make a mistake. 
I don't know that that constitutes a false teacher. Those things, they can be corrected as long as the heart is right. In those situations, we can be like Priscilla and Aquila were with Apollos. We can take that person to the side. We can make correction with the truth. But there are those that are blatantly teaching false doctrine. And they continue to do so even when they're shown what the word says. In those cases, we're thinking about the health of the church. We cannot tolerate that teaching. Otherwise, it can kill the church. So false teaching is something that we need to be aware of and guarding against. Now, another tactic that Satan uses to attack churches, and this is to attack churches as a whole, but even Christians individually, is trials. Things like persecution, hard times, even a worldwide pandemic. Going back to Revelation chapter 2, we see an example, you know, that sometimes people will, or sometimes Satan will attack those of the faith with physical persecution. Smyrna was a church that says that they were being met with this persecution by those that claimed to be Jews, but they were actually of the synagogue of Satan. They were told, do not fear what you are about to suffer. It says that some were going to be even thrown into prison. But God gave them hope. He says that basically paraphrasing, if you'll be faithful despite your persecutions, he says, be faithful unto death in that passage, you'll receive the crown of life. Understand though that not all trials they come from those that would not all trials come from those that would persecute us because of our faith. Sometimes trials just happen because we live in a fallen creation that is not a paradise. James chapter one, for example, refers to trials, he says, of various kinds. James chapter 1, beginning of that passage. When I think of various trials that we might face, I think of maybe there's economic trials some of us might be going through. Sometimes there are natural disasters. Our area is not you know, uh, immune to that. We've seen that happen in our time. We've seen that happen recently up north. Sometimes it could be our health. We prayed for that just a little bit ago. That can certainly be a trial. Certainly also for all of us here all over the world, We've mentioned the worldwide pandemic. Certainly over this past couple of years, we've experienced a different kind of trial than perhaps we've ever experienced in our lives. And I'm not suggesting that every time something bad happens in our lives, that I'm not suggesting that that is Satan trying to get us. But I would suggest to you that the Bible teaches it's obviously a tactic that he does use. And he has been successful in getting a lot of people with this tactic. One reason that so many people leave the church is that they just cannot reconcile how God would allow bad things to happen to good people. And that may be, actually, that's probably an idea for a lesson in a later time. And whether Satan was behind the pandemic or not, would you say that he's been very successful at using this circumstance to draw people away from serving God? And how many churches have ceased to assemble together as the result of the things we've gone through the last couple of years. How many people have stopped going to church because of the things that have happened? Satan has won a lot of souls to his cause. He has killed a lot of churches. We cannot let him kill the church here. So how, how should we respond to trials? Well, John chapter 12 indicates that sometimes when trials come, people are silenced. What I mean by silence is not just with their words, it keeps them from doing the things that God would have them to do. The example I'm talking about in John chapter 12 is when the authorities, it says when they believed in Jesus, they let their fear of the backlash they thought they would get from the Pharisees, they let that keep them from confessing their faith in Christ. We recently talked about last week, confession is something that we do as a result of our faith in Christ. It's part of serving Christ. We can't let persecution, we can't let trials prevent us from serving Christ. Christians are to rejoice. Well, I'm one behind, sorry. Christians are to rejoice. I'm thinking about Acts chapter 5. When the apostles, when they were arrested and they were questioned for their faith, what did they do in Acts chapter 5? Did they stay silent? It says we must obey God rather than men. Then later on in that passage, it says that they were beaten. And then, when they're, and then when they were sent away and told not to speak of Jesus, what did they do? They left 
And it says they left rejoicing. Why? They were counted worthy to suffer for the name of Christ. The passage we mentioned earlier in James chapter 1 where it was talking about trials. James says that we ought to count it all joy. Why? Because James teaches us that it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for our faith to be tested. And it's an opportunity for us to develop patience and steadfastness. So the question I want us to pose this morning as we think about this second point, how will the church here respond to trials? How have we responded to trials over the past couple of years? I would ask you this morning, would you say that the Christian response to trials, should it be a stark contrast to the rest of the world? I think that's a very safe observation. You know, when the world panics, when the world shudders in fear, we ought to find ourselves rejoicing. Our eternity is secure. Our confidence is in God. I would ask you this morning, what message would it send if we let the fear of persecution, we let the discouragement that comes from trials, if we let that keep us from serving God as He wants for us to do? I don't think that's the message that we want to send. If this church does not resolve to stand strong through trials, it will weaken us. Maybe to the point of our topic this morning of death. If we respond to our trials in the wrong ways, again, it can kill the church. And we don't need to let it do that. One more thing I want to talk about this morning in our lesson is the fact that one of the biggest silent killers of the church is apathy. So apathy, if you were to define it, apathy is defined as a lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. When you think about those characteristics, those are not characteristics that harmonize with the work of the church. And I say this one in particular is a silent killer because it can so easily go unnoticed. Because on the surface, and we'll talk about some symptoms that you may notice, but usually on the surface, everything might seem fine. But inwardly, there's a problem. Just as with the other two we mentioned, apathy was a, was a, a tactic that was used by Satan in the first century to attack churches of Christ. We noted uh, the Ephesian church earlier in our lesson in, in Revelation chapter 2. And you notice as you go through there, Satan had tried different things trying to get to this church. Apparently he had tried false teaching, but they stood strong. He must have tried to get them with some kind of trial because it says that they had endured patiently. But I want you to notice what got them. They had abandoned their first love. Laodicea, likewise also in Revelation 3, we remember they were described as lukewarm. Lukewarm to the point that God was disgusted with them. I was reading in a, a brother's comment on this topic and I really liked his quote on this part of the text. He says, We do not have to oppose the church to kill it. Just be slothful. And indifferent. I'm going to read that one more time. We do not have to oppose the church to kill it. Just be slothful and indifferent. Did you hear that? You do not have to actively go against the mission of the church to kill it. You just have to not try. And you just have to not care. Now, sometimes these things may go unnoticed. Again, the outside may be fine, but sometimes there are symptoms. And we're going to talk about what apathy in the church might look like. First, I want to mention half-hearted worship. Recently, we talked a good bit about the topic of worship, and we also mentioned, you know, we were talking about how to improve our worship. And we said that most of the way that we can improve our worship is how? By having the right attitudes in our heart. You know, if we're just here this morning, if we're just looking to check a box, and our heart is not in this worship, that is a symptom of apathy. I think another symptom might be when you're looking at the church as a whole. Is there a declining effort to reach the lost? Earlier this year, we talked about evangelism. We talked about the importance of taking advantage of this opportunity that we have. You know, we talked about sometimes economic factors may cause a church to decline just because people are leaving the area. But that's the opposite for us. People are coming in in big numbers. It presents an opportunity for us to reach the lost. We talked about in those lessons the natural reaction of those that were saved by the gospel in the New Testament was to do what? They went and they told others about it. Why? Because when they experienced God's saving grace, 
They didn't want anyone else to miss out on. I would ask you, what does it say about our faith if more and more we don't find the message of the gospel important enough to share with others? That's a symptom of apathy. Irregular attendance. And we've talked about this one a lot before. I know I've mentioned it before, but I think it fits right here as a symptom. You know, we've already said one, and I've mentioned this before, the numbers that you see over here, they don't always tell the entire story. And one way that it can't tell the entire story is we just said, you can be here physically. On the outside, it looks fine. But you can be apathetic about it. Well, that's a problem too. But sometimes, apathy does result in us choosing not to be with the saints. Because if we're indifferent about learning what God's Word says, if we're indifferent about worshiping Him, if we're indifferent about encouraging our brother, we'll choose to be somewhere and do the things that we are passionate about. You know, I realize that sometimes there are factors beyond our control. We've mentioned a long list of sick. We mentioned those that are struggling with their health, and that is certainly understandable. We pray for those people. But if our desire is to serve the Lord and for the church to hear, to grow and thrive, we have to realize that having an apathetic attitude towards being with the saints is not going to just hurt ourselves. It's going to hurt our brethren as well. One more. Seeking to do the bare minimum. We mentioned earlier when we were defining apathy that apathy includes the idea of being enthusiastic, showing enthusiasm. So if apathy is to lack enthusiasm, I said that backwards, didn't I? If apathy is to lack enthusiasm, are people that are enthusiastic, are they going to see what little they can get by with? Jesus, He did not say, love the Lord your God with this much heart and this much soul and this much mind. He says, love the Lord your God with all of it. I was thinking of a song that we sometimes sing, I surrender all. I don't remember the last time we sung that, but we ought to sing that sometime. What are we saying in that song? All to Jesus, I surrender. All to Him, I freely give. That's not a song to sing if you're here just looking to give God the bare minimum to get by. If the only time that we study the Scriptures, if the only time that we think about spiritual things or even if the only time that we spend time with our brethren is within the assembly, we need to examine ourselves. Now these four, there's probably other symptoms that I just didn't get time to go through this morning. These are just a few symptoms of apathy. And as we said, apathy, it can kill a church. And if we're exhibiting these symptoms, we need to make corrections. Otherwise, we might suffer. And the church here might suffer as well. One more thing I want to mention before we get to our conclusion. This is not on the slide. This is not on the handouts or anything like that. I was just thinking about how the unfortunate thing about apathy is one thing we say is that it might cause us to avoid our brethren. And I say that that's unfortunate because one of the best ways that we have to fight against apathy within the church is for us to be together. The passage we always refer to here is Hebrews chapter 10 because it tells us that part of the assembly, part of the purpose of the assembly is to encourage one another. And I bring this up thinking about our trials, thinking about the past couple of years, thinking about this topic. Satan has certainly used this pandemic as a means to try and separate us and keep us from being together. I think that this is certainly a hindrance to the church if he is successful. When you go back to the early church in Acts chapter 2 and you think about their example, we often describe how they look, what that must have been like to have been a part of that church. One thing that you notice in Acts chapter 2, they were always together. And I'm not just talking about the official assemblies on Sundays and Wednesdays. It says that they met day by day, did they not? But it talks about that they were breaking bread together with one another in their homes. I would suggest to us as we get to this upcoming year, Let's do what we can to get back to this pattern. Brethren are meant to be together. We need to be together in the assembly as we're doing this morning. I'm not trying to diminish that. But let's look to be together outside of that as well for those that are willing and those that are able. And Lord willing, we look forward, when I'm talking about we, I'm talking about Karen and I, we look forward to helping with this when our house is, Lord willing, ready sometime next year. And I'm looking forward to that because I've missed that.
So in conclusion this morning, we have asked the question, what can kill a church? Again, it's a very serious subject. And we've talked about three ways that he can do that. Perhaps we'll talk about some others at a different time. We've talked about the fact that he can try and tear down the church through false teaching. He may try and suppress the church through trials. He may use apathy as a means to keep us from serving God as we ought to. <coughs> Let's not let him be successful. Let's not let him be successful, especially with the church here. So as we look at the church here and as we consider these things, how are we doing? Are we standing for the truth? Are we remaining steadfast through our trials? Are we passionate about serving God and one another? It is my prayer that this church will grow and thrive and will be a shining light to those that have not yet obeyed the gospel. And as we close here this morning with that thought in mind, you may be here and you've not yet obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Understand this morning the invitation, it stands open and it's the Lord's invitation. But it's not going to last forever. Second Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 says that one day the Lord will return and He is going to punish those that don't obey the gospel. So if you're here this morning, you've not yet obeyed the gospel. It's talking about you. You must put your trust in Christ for salvation by repenting of your sins. As we talked about last week, by being willing to confess Him before others. And by being baptized as He commands for the forgiveness of our sins. So if you're here this morning, you've not yet done that. Why not? And if you'd like to change that, you're invited now to come forward as we stand and as we sing.